All right, thank you for having me today. And I'm very excited to join y'all and share a little bit about what my last three and a half years have comprised of in terms of practical application. I've loved every minute of it, work with a great group of guys, and I've learned a lot, and it's been a wonderful experience thus far. So as Dr. Wentz has mentioned, I work with the Thor 3 program, one of the Thor 3 programs on Fort Bragg, and I'm going to share a bunch of different fun stories with you today. It's going to be a little bit different pace and tone than the high science base that you've had for the past few talks. It will give you a little bit different feel for the environment and uh, how my day-to-day -day is comprised. So the, my afternoon today was actually perfectly timed in, in a very odd way because it's everything that I'm talking to you about today was my last consult of the day. Uh, yesterday was a hard day for our unit. We actually attended two memorial uh, scenarios. One of our guys had um, was killed in action, and we had his memorial in the morning, and then that afternoon we had the three uh, memorial stones that were laid for the three guys la we lost on this last appointment. Well, this team came in, and they specifically had a really high op tempo, and they asked for us to screen through a whole bunch of different biomarkers and just get an idea on how they're coming back home and how we can get them recovered as quickly as possible. So one of our guys was actually in my office today. He reached out and said, can I just swing by and talk to you? I just really want to change the tone for everything and I, and I really want to start documenting this and be completely honest. I said, absolutely, swing by. Uh, I'll, I'll carve out time in my day for you. We sat down. And he opens up the session with talking about how he has this constant ringing in his ears. And he has a complete brain fog. He can't articulate words. He's also in a course right now where he has to be able to use his brain very heavily to <laughs> every single day. And he has to write papers at night. So the brain aspect that we're talking about, it's very real. And it affects every single one of our guys all the time. They specifically were exposed to combat every single day and shot more rounds than they, and exposed to more rounds than they're actually supposed to, even though that count isn't exactly known to a T. And he used the description of he ate multiple IADs in the process, way too close to them, ate multiple charges. And as we've already heard from our past two presenters, this has an impact on the brain. Uh, a great presenter I watched last uh, August, I think it was, when we were at that conference. Uh, he described it as brain twerking. So let's hit lighten the mood a bit. It is like your brain is twerking inside of your skull. And uh, that is what's happening with every single charge. Now if you shift gears and you think about what is the exposure on a day-to-day -day not in a deployed setting, you'd think, oh great, it's going to get better. But then when you go out to their training courses, well, what about the instructors who are there who are standing on a catwalk watching for safety and every single charge that goes off, they're feeling. I, was, I go and help out at some of these courses from a nutrition perspective and I screen for different field testing parameters so that we can educate on this exact scenario. And we do some TBI screens and, and check their blood for cortisol, for hyper-awareness and see how this impact is, is impacting them in total. And it's just really interesting. I'm standing super far from the, the house that they're actually charging the doors off of, and on the complete opposite end of the range. And the charge goes off, and I can feel it. It's like my organs inside my body are just jiggling. Like, it doesn't cease to ever change that reaction of that jolt inside me. I don't know if it gets better for any of the guys that we serve with, but it, I've been out there for multiple courses now, and it has not changed. So the reality is, is we don't know how much is too much, and we already know that they're overexposed. And then you couple that with the unknown of what's happening to them with heavy metal exposure. There's a lot of other considerations that in order to even figure out where to start in terms of managing this for them from an application perspective, 
What are their symptoms? Is it a recent exposure or is it just a constant exposure? Is it a his historical exposure or is there anything we can do to be proactive? And then to top it off, they're highly stressed and because of that high irritability factor, what do you think they all want to do before they go home? They want to unwind with a couple beers. That is the setting and that is the reality of the setting. And telling them that they can't doesn't usually bode well. So having to find the right types of arguments. So fortunately, it's been a positive experience and the guys enjoy having me out there, which is a relief. I can't say that was always the truth, but <laughs> they've gotten used to me out there. And we, we talk about all the science and fun nutrients that involve a dietitian. You've already been told multiple times about the impact of omega-3, but when we're talking about concussion, the specific one that we're looking for is a high DHA quantity. Um, that's specific to the brain. The reality is that most of these guys have joint and bodily inflammation they're managing as well, so looking for EPA is equally as important in my eyes when I look at the whole, the whole package, the whole person. So, as we navigate through this, the problem is, is that most of the products on the market are not always, they're not equal. They're not apples to apples. So if they, what is the biggest exposure here? Well, it's sensitive to light and heat. So if they're keeping it in their car, well, they're oxidizing their product. And they're just trying to have it for an accessibility component. They're trying to be compliant, but then they're falling short. The other reality is that most of the time they just go out and cost is a factor. They have families. They have families to feed. They have tons of kids. And they are known for putting themselves last and everyone else in front of them. So asking them to put their whole budget into a product is not something that they are always going to do. It's a, it's a harsh reality, but it's true. So then telling them, OK, well, is your bottle that you're buying on that product, how translucent is it? If you're looking for the easiest product, well, flip it over. Well, if, this is, if you're coming to see me because you just were exposed to a bunch of charges, well, now we need to talk about how much of that product is made up of EPA versus DHA. And the conversation will shift. And it shifts depending on the scenario. Other things that I typically hear when it comes to omega-3 is that they don't like to take it because of the fish burps. They're like, ugh, I don't like that. Well, there are some different things. One, it's a, usually an indicator that it's a poor quality fish oil. So that's the first thing I tell them. I'm like, all right, let's reinvest in a new product. Um, aside from that, then there's some other strategy you can do. So if you take it in the morning, eat after you take that. And that'll go a long way, and that'll help with that tolerance right there. Moving on to vitamin D, that is a common thing for any time I have a, a new guy come see me we will screen vitamin D. It's the very first thing, and the dosing is usually based off of that. There are some general maintenance um, ideas, but I, to be honest, every single guy I've screened, I rarely find someone who is in, within an optimal range of 50 to 70. So almost every single one of them is in the 20s or below. I have a few in the 30s. It's usually not a great number. <laughs> so I'm always then communicating with our docs to get prescriptions for them. But the biggest thing is that for the longest time, on the formulary over um, on Fort Bragg, we only had access to D2. Unfortunately, this isn't the most bioavailable format, and we lose most of it. And this is the format that's in your food. So then all, everyone's like, well, can I just eat it? I'm like, I love that you're trying to embrace nutrition. But no, you can't just eat it. <laughs> so the D3 format is going to be very important in actually improving those lab values for them. And yes, you can step out in the sun, but the reality is that in this geographic location, we're not at the proper latitude to actually absorb the UV rays at the right angle to get D3 from the sun properly. So the geographical location works into it, plus we have seasons. I was, it, what, it was like 26 or 30 something degrees this morning. I came into work with sweatpants and a sweatshirt, and oh, I work in a building without any windows. So I have no exposure to the sun, and my whole body is covered. So now when you take, take me out of the equation and put our guys in it, well, our guys and our gals, they're all covered out as well. So once again, that absorption from the sun, even though it is a common recommendation, it's just not necessarily a feasible one. So supplementation becomes necessary. And then of course that protection prior, creatine, creatine monohydrate is 
very buy available. It's also most affordable, and you can find plenty of reputable sources. But the dosing would be, if you were to preload, you could do 20 grams a day for, and set in four separate doses for a week, and then you can transition into the five grams per day for that protection onto the brain prior. And then, of course, the big thing, if there is a recent exposure or if they're in a heavy volume course or if they are deployed downrange, reducing alcohol and caffeine consumption. They usually laugh at me when I say that, but <laughs> that is going to be key because that additional stimulation and inflammation to the brain as well coming from those sources. All right, so transitioning, so they're not usually just a TBI scenario. Now we have what's going on with the full package. Well, all my guys like to be bigger, faster, stronger. That's the reality, that's their goal. And I want them to be faster and I want them to be stronger. I don't necessarily want them to be bigger. I like to think of it as, so <laughs> this, didn't happen at, this didn't happen at the job that I'm at here at Fort Bragg, but at a different one, we bought new chairs. They're the nice chairs, they like retract back, all this stuff. Well, I'm not necessarily a big person, but uh, people just my same size were leaning back in the chair, what happens? The whole thing breaks and they fall backwards. I mean, everybody in the room laughed. Not that that's funny, but in the moment, everybody was like, oh my God, what do you do when you're uncomfortable? You, you typically laugh. But uh, the reality is, is the weight was too big for the frame, the frame of that chair. It was unstable. And what I'm commonly seeing with our, with our guys is that based off their frame, they're so heavily loaded that it actually becomes more of a, a, a risk factor. How loaded is their frame for the type of activity that they're engaged in? How often are they landing? And is that bad landing just because it was a bad landing, or is it because you were already too heavily loaded and that compounded onto that landing itself? It's a bigger picture piece, and it takes it another whole step. And trust me, the assessment for it takes forever. But I enjoy it, fortunately, and it is totally worth it because it helps create a better conversation. Can you get stronger without necessarily getting bigger? And the answer to that is absolutely. So this ends up becoming a, uh, a topic for bringing in multiple people into the room from different disciplines to collaborate on different cases. We need this guy to have less on his frame because it is a risk factor. And when you think about it, it's not just what's on their frame in terms of within their actual body, it's what else is going on top of it. The 75 extra pounds of, of armor and of a rucksack, and then you have your weapons, that all adds weight. And then how far are they actually moving? What is the movement? Are they in mountains, or what is the scenario? All that goes into play when you're talking about the trauma that's happening to them from a musculoskeletal standpoint. So what are the special considerations with that? Well, when I have a musculoskeletal case, I have to think, are they gonna have surgery? Is this repairable without surgery? Uh, what is the inflammation? Are they gonna be immobilized? If they're immobilized for a significant period of time, I'm gonna have to up their protein, which is gonna affect their whole diet as well. What is, what is the timeline and where is the specific targeted injury? So typically, uh, about 20 to 40 grams Per, uh, per time point, every three to four hours is going to be one easy approach to make sure you're kind of turning on protein synthesis throughout the day significantly. But the reality is if they are immobilized, that whole recommendation will change. It'll alter because it will increase. Then specifically going back to what Dr. Rents had mentioned about the collagen and gelatin with vitamin C, that's commonly loved by all of our guys. And you have some options here. You can go with collagen or you can go with gelatin. I, I have a recipe. You can actually make jello. They're like jello jigglers, squares. I actually recommend that you don't do all that work. You can get silicone cups, pop those babies right out. Super easy. So we can make it simple. We can make it easy and efficient. Most of them want to just throw it into a shake. But if that's the case, you need to get the gelatin that does not coagulate. So then you're looking at different a different type and it gets a little bit more specific here. But the vitamin C is very important in this uh, scenario because it helps with the absorption. So we can't actually forget about that piece. And then of course, omega-3 once again plays its role 
is terms, in terms of helping with that inflammation management. Depending on what the scenario is, though, we may or may not want to start supplementation with that right away. I totally agree with doing it beforehand, but if they just had surgery, there is some degree of allowing the inflammatory process to happen for up to about two weeks, naturally. And this is where it involves working with your uh, PT and your, phys your physical therapist to actually see, okay, at what point can we start really, when is it too much in inflammation? When do we really have to bring that inflammation back down through another source? Now, I don't necessarily say avoid anti-inflammatory foods. That would not be what would I would say. But <laughs> going with supplementation in high doses, it's absolutely needed post-op. It's just the timing of it. And the timing of it, I'm not qualified to determine. I would have to work with someone else to determine that. Last time I spoke with our PT, who's actually here, it was, we agreed roughly about two weeks is appropriate. We're doing it before and then allowing the inflammatory process happen post-op. Yes, I would love to. So that is one aspect that we have um, worked on, and then uh, we would consume it absolutely prior, and then anytime it's an injury that is not post-op, we would immediately start it right away. In terms of inflammation management, this could come from a variety of things. Our guys have tons of hobbies, so I have a guy that climbed Everest for fun. That was what he did for just enjoyment. I have another many guys that like to do ultras, and their ultras are 24-hour um, events maybe, and that is just the reality of what these guys like to do. They love to do high activity things, and they already have a high activity demanded work, workload. So when you couple that, and then you add to the fact that they're like, constantly thinking, oh my goodness, I want to do more, I want to do more, and I want to do more, convincing them to take rest is not always a easy feat. Now, that doesn't mean we don't push for it anyway, but we do have to consider at what point is that exercise-induced stress almost too much in addition to the emotional stress, the cortisol that's coming from the hyper production from just the reality of their workplace and their job. Financial stresses at home, all these things come into play. And then when we go out into the ranges and we actually look at what's happening to them and collect these biomarkers, determining are they in a sympathetic or parasympathetic pathway is significantly important for determining what is our next step. What is this person relying on fight or flight arousal to actually perform their job well? If so, well, that's problematic because now we're heading them into this, this, this crutch of I need this uh, life-saving this life-saving response to actually perform day to day, all day, and that ends up taxing the thyroid, it ends up taxing the uh, pancreas, it ends up taxing the whole entire body, and so we have to understand what's happening in that scenario in order to make our next steps. So what are the symptoms? What's going on? Is this a weight management issue? Has it impacted your sleep? If it has done any of those things, all of the next steps in terms of interven intervention would absolutely vary. <laughs> all right, so here we have different antioxidants, polyphenols, specifically tart cherry juice is a common one that's very well founded and used. We have played with curcumin and aged garlic extract um, from a stress seminar that I attended last year, just trying to get a better gauge on how we can really understand all the variable amounts of stressors. How can we better attack this from as many angles as possible? And this is one of the approaches we've used. I allow them to kind of choose what they want to go with from their attack. We, of course, always use omega-3 as well, but instead of putting it on the third slide, we decided to throw in some other options that we put in here. And um, the main idea here is how, um, how many ways can you look at it, and what is the timing of it, and how many scenarios are you dealing with stress? Are oftentimes guys 
come to me and they're like, man, I, there's a lot of research out there that says don't do anti-inflammatories immediately post-workout and because it'll blunt their adaptations to training. But periodized approach to strategizing this, if you have that much exposure to additional stress, well, it might be okay for you to not have some of those adaptations and training at that moment. And you can easily just throw that into your routine for a time period to reduce that chronic inflammation that might be ongoing in your body. But then I have to work with my strength coach and have a re good relationship with him so he understands that that guy in that moment is not necessarily going to have major progressions through his training program. And then, of course, we have the advantage of uh, being in the military. You get all this exposure to all these new different places, some of which are, they would say are really amazing and cool, and some of which they would say are not. But um, it is a, an advantage, but it's also a challenge. So with that, when you think about every single new place you go, every new region, there are new bacteria and pathogens that your gut is exposed to, as you all have already previously heard from multiple people. And most of them are so worried and concerned about getting the protein that they need, getting other things in terms of into their, into their very limited space of what they can pack, that they usually forget one big thing, which is probiotics. And have you, as you have already heard from the past two presenters, your gut microbiome is huge. It is the most important organ in your body that most people would debate, absolutely, right? The gut lining integrity, it matters. It's where you absorb all of your nutrients. So if it is inflamed or if it is compromised and the number of bad pathogens or the bad bacteria outweighs the good, well, that's where we start to see that health degrade. And the other re unfortunate reality is that many times, or actually all the time, as a protective measure, what do our guys get given? They get given tons and tons of antibiotics to help avoid them getting exposed to other things. But what does that antibiotic do? It ruins all the good bacteria just as much as it ruins the bad bacteria. So this is the top thing that I usually recommend for guys as they deploy. I'm not even, even if they're going just for training, TDY here in the US, and it's in a completely different region, we're talking about packing probiotics with them because it's a different environment. And as you've already heard about both the importance of both prebiotics and probiotics, it's a matter of making sure that you're getting both. One feeds the other. So once you have good bacteria, you need to feed it and you need to keep it well. The other unfortunate reality is that with the high stress and poor sleep and high irritability, what are the main things that guys consume? They consume high amounts of sugar to combat those cravings, and they have lots of alcohol. And both of those categories of, are, of consumption foods or beverages are going to absolutely deteriorate and feed the bad bacteria in the gut. So is this an option that they should be on probably all the time? Absolutely. The reality is, once again, when they're faced with what they can choose to spend their money on, what are they going to what are they going to invest in? So there's this whole concept of periodizing their supplement strategies because it's coming out of their pocket. So what is more important? It could be DHA for them, depending on their scenario. And then this might only be a during deployment option. In terms of immune function, it's not necessarily one of these alone that's necessarily bad. Actually, they all are. They all will impact your immune function in terms of the demands of their job. However, it's the combination of all of them. They're all overtrained. They're all traveling all the time. And they're all exposed to multiple new environments. They're all hypocaloric, for sure. The reality is, is they are constantly overstressed. And that extra stress is affecting their hormone, hormone production which is making it a weight management concern, and they have to make weight. So now they're additionally employing all of these extreme diets to try and make their weight appropriate, and it's all this very vicious cycle. 
So how can we really curb that? Well, we have to start somewhere. <laughs> and some of the easy, low-hanging fruit is that's partly why I'm out there talking about dehydration during training. Or that's why our mental performance coach is out there talking about sleep after a long night shoot, because they're low-hanging fruit. But we do have to take it in stride one thing at a time and see what they're willing to do first. So as uh, Dr. Wentz had mentioned, one easy thing to do is to basically in incorporate those carbs in long sustained training. One common thing during long training hours, I find that guys don't tend to eat. They're busy doing other things. They're busy reloading or they're, it's not always commonly used. It's another inconvenience. If they're in the middle of a land navigation session, then a training segment, they have their hands full. So you have to make it easy. You have to make it simple. And they don't always like it because it's always some, sometimes it's high sugar. And there's this big MO that sugar is bad. But in these instances, sugar is great. We need sugar. We need this, that carbohydrate to fuel performance. Rapid digesting carbs are going to be better for gut tolerance. But depending on what the activity is, that rapid digesting carb is going to spike right away. So how do we sustain that? I'm not saying go and eat fiber one bars, because that would feel awful. However, there are tricks of looking at a food label in terms of looking at how much carbs it has and how much fiber it has. You can divide the two and see what that ratio is. And you can get closer depending on what their gut tolerates. No matter what, at the end of the day, they have to train on this. And depending on how long they're training, so if they're out there uh, ruck, rucking for six hours in a row, some of them might need up to 90 grams of carbs per hour. Absolutely. But they have to train on it. If they go do it on the first time, they might feel very sick. So it's it's something that they have to play with, and usually when they're doing certain types of training, we do multiple sessions where we talk about different products, and I, they work with different samples and try different things out and find out what works for them. Glutamine is great for gut health. It's great for immune function, so it kind of doubles here as two great things that it's known for. Um, dosing is provided here. It's typically based off of weight, but I did the calculation for roughly a 200-pound individual. You're looking for about 4.5 grams four times per day. And then vitamin D and zinc. The main thing is if you're um, a vegetarian, which is not terribly common in this environment. However, if you are a vegetarian, you're probably not consuming enough zinc. So looking into, okay, what sources are you choosing that from? And then that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it, but thank you very much for your time.